The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So the key question is, do these, and I think this is a general question you can ask metabolically inside any cell, um, is do these enzymes that are on different polypeptides cluster? And is there an advantage, kinetically or whatever, is there some kind of an advantage to have clustering um, inside the cell? And where have you seen something like this before? Do you remember? Do you remember the the uh, section where have you seen, you know, multi enzyme complexes and clustering before? Yeah. yeah. So, so or the, the classic one, PKS, you know, has been around, but it's completely analogous to fatty acid synthesis, right? And so, in bacteria, they're all single polypeptides. In humans, they're all activities that are on single chains. Okay, so. And that's sort of what's going on here with the purine pathway. We'll see there, there are 10, this just sort of helps us focus when, if we get to the data at the end, which I think we will from, from what we did the last time, that is that you have six enzymes for, um, for 10 activities. So that just means you have more than one enzyme per polypeptide, okay? And so I guess the key thing that I wanted to focus on is, uh, do you think it's important to cluster? Um, here's a pathway. These are the names. We're not going to go through the names. The names really aren't important for what we're doing. There will be two names that we'll be looking at over and over again. Um, these are the papers that you guys um, did, in fact, read. One is the original paper, which got a lot of press. and. Um, and I just wanted to show you that there have been, there's actually been four papers published in the last six months on this topic, and one of which um, was published, I think, yeah, one of which is published um, with Science, where they are now claiming that this complex is localized to the mitochondria. Okay, so if you, do you take pictures, and this is it. Um, this is looking at um, super resolution fluorescence methods, and you can clearly see you know, clumps of blobs focused on the mitochondria. Why would you want it to be at the mitochondria? Um, so then you have to ask your question. You might need purines because that's where you make through a protomotive force and respiration. Remember when you, when you convert oxygen to water, you get a huge amount of energy release. You make ATP, but it's got to be made from something. So maybe you would want, that's the way they rationalize it. And they do, and then they connect it to the other latest hot topic, which is mTOR, which is the major signaling switch for fatty acids and for amino acids. And now, in the last two years, um, purines and pyrimidines. I decided I've done a lot of reading, but I decided I didn't believe. I mean, I believe it, but I don't believe the connections yet. So again, this is what you're going to see in the next decade: is connecting signaling to primary metabolic pathways, like the purine pathway. That's going to be a big thing, and how do you connect them is going to be the key question. So anybody that wants to do some more reading, this is an updated version. I kept updating this three or four times. Um, and so I think these are the key questions we want to focus on. And so what I'm going to do, I'll define the questions a little bit um, and whether the things we need to think about to, to determine whether this is really um, important biologically. Um, then we'll define fluorescence and what you can do with fluorescence. And then we'll come back and look at the data um, in the paper. We're also going to look, we probably won't get all the way through all of the data, but we will look at some of that data again um, in either the next lecture or Wednesday's lecture. So you will see it again if we don't get through the data. Um, so so um, they claim they have a multi-enzyme complex. Um, did you believe that from the data? I mean, they didn't look at all 10 enzymes simultaneously, right? Or six enzymes. Whatever they showed us, 
what what you see. Yeah. Okay. So so that was that was said. We'll, we'll look at some of those pictures, but I completely agree with that. That you can't see anything from fluorescence pictures. So, you know, everybody, all chemists or chemical biologists now have huge numbers of these pictures in in their papers. And and with Alice's group, I'm always on that case that I cannot tell a damn thing. This is on theses. I can't see anything. And Alice says she can't see anything either. Okay, so it's very hard to see things in, in these pictures. The contrast isn't very good. And what her lab now does is it goes to EM, where you can see things much more clearly. The fluorescence things are tough, so you're not the only one. And if somebody says it's obvious that this and you don't see it, raise your hand and say, I don't see it. Show me what I should be looking at. Okay, so that's a good take home message because everybody and his brother is doing this. Um, and this goes back to knowing how to, how to do it correctly. We're not going to talk about any of that stuff. I mean, every one of the methods I'll sort of show you that's out there, you have to really study it um, to make sure you're handling it correctly. So, I mean, I think to me, this has been a problem that I've been interested in, and, and I started working on this a long time ago in the purine pathway. Um, is are not our things sticking together important? Actually, I don't think those are important. You immunoprecipitate all these things, okay? So you say, ah, oh, obviously these are talking to each other. But the key thing is the kinetic competence. And lots of times when you, you mess around, you get it in a state, you post-translationally modify it. So it's sitting in this state that probably isn't on the pathway. You need to then show it's on the pathway. So I think most, a lot of protein-protein interactions, especially now that we know that proteins move around, and they're in this complex, and they're in that complex, and they're in that complex. The key, I think, is transient interactions. So, why? So this is just my personal take on this. I'm letting you think about this. But is it easy to look at transient interactions? No. <laughs> okay. So anyhow, I think people need to start doing a lot more thinking about how to look at that. And one way you could look at transient interactions is if you can fluorescently label something and they come together on a certain time scale and then move apart. And can you do that inside the cell with the right spatial um, and time resolution? You might be able to start looking at that. So the, the methods that are being developed and continue to be developed are incredibly powerful and I think will allow us to ask this question of, of what happens inside the cell, which you've all seen pictures in your introductory courses of, man, how complicated the inside of the cell is. That's part of, part of the issue. So the issue is that you might have a purinosome somewhere in the cell, depending on the growth conditions, but those enzymes might be involved in other things, and so you have only a tiny amount of it, as opposed to trying to make the cell by growth conditions, putting it into all one state so you can see it. So the question is, how do you see it? Okay, and so that's the key issue. And if you perturb it enough and you do see it, then you have to ask the question, and this is a question that you might want to think about in terms of these two papers you were reading. You know, that's what Mark, you know, if you do this, this that's what the Marcotte paper said, that the cells were incredibly sick when you take out all the purines, and in fact, um, Alice's, because of this mitochondria connection between the purinosome and Alice's interest in the mitochondria, um, she's had people trying to repeat this, and Vicki Hung worked on this and couldn't repeat it. Okay, so she didn't spend that much time on it, but all I'm saying, it's not a slam dunk um, to be able to do this. But that being said, I think this has been an issue that people have been thinking about for decades, and it's just really hard to test experimentally inside the cell, and this is where we need chemical biologists to figure out new ways of being able to look at this so that you can actually make a measurement um, that's interesting. Um, so, so I guess the question I want to start with before we, we start looking at fluorescence is why do you think it would be important to do this, or do you think it would be important to have a complex? What, what's the advantage of doing that? Yeah? You were saying in the lecture that Right. By having all these things right next to each other, uh, there's obviously you're, you're going to have like more interactions per second. Well, you may or may you may not. It depends 
So, what, so I think this is the key question. You know, is diffusion fast inside the cell? Yeah, it's still very fast. For small molecules, it's incredibly fast. Even for proteins, it's incredibly fast. So even if this guy is over here, if you're turning over here at a much slower rate and you have enough of them so you can interact at diffusion control, do you need this organization? There are a lot of smart people who think you don't need that. There are a lot of smart people who think you do need that. But this is the question I want to raise. However, so catalytic efficiency is absolutely it. But where might you really need catalytic efficiency? And so that goes back. There are places where you really need this. OK. So if you look at the, the first intermediate in the pathway, this guy. What do you think about that guy? Do you think he's stable? So if you look at the first intermediate in the pathway, which we'll talk about next time. So this is amino phosphoribose. I'm drawing a complete. I think I'm tired. Anyhow, um, it's the amino analog of ribose 5-phosphate. Phosphoribosylamine, that's what it's called, P-R-A. OK, do you think that's stable as chemists? So what do you think that could do? Um, could you release the amine? Yeah, so how would you do that? So if it's protonated and then the ring opens, so. OK, so that would be one way. You want to release it that way. OK, so you'd have to, it would have to be under conditions where you could do that. Under neutral conditions, what else can happen to this ring? That doesn't happen. There are lots of ways this molecule can break down, OK? And depends on, it depends on the details of the environment. How else could this molecule ring open? Well, you wouldn't need to ring open here. You just go through an oxo um, carbenian ion and have water attack. So what if it opens that way? So that's the way you form aldehydes. All sugars are in equilibrium with aldehydes. These things are in equilibrium. So you have a ring open species. But then what happens if it ring closes? It can ring close from the top face to the bottom face. Okay. You have an imine. What can happen to the imine? It can hydrolyze. Okay. This molecule, um, and this is a molecule my lab worked on decades ago, has a half life in solution of 10 seconds. Okay. So is 10 seconds short or long biologically? What do you think? I short, yeah, I think it's amazingly long inside the cell. So I think as a chemist, yeah, nobody could ever, nobody ever saw this intermediate. My lab was the first one that figured out how to look at it, you know, and I won't go through that. But the fact is that 10 seconds is a long time inside the cell if you think about how small the cell is and how fast diffusion is. Okay. So one place, though, where you might want to have organization is if you have something chemically really unstable, OK? Because then when you generate it, it could potentially be passed off, or as you say, in the immediate vicinity, it's a competition. But if it's right there, your effective molarity, that would, that would get into that first question, the effective molarity, it would be high enough to get passed on. It would get high enough to get passed on in the ne to the next guy. Um, in the pathway. So, okay, so that would be one thing is instability. Um, and in the purine pathway, I'm not, we, we'll go through this a little bit, but really that's one of the things that's most amazing about Buchanan's elucidation of the pathway is all the intermediates are unstable. Nobody still, if you're looking at omics, looking at nucleotides, nobody knows how to deal with these molecules. They're all chemically unstable, okay, and they don't get they're chemically unstable. They don't ever see them. The reason they don't see them because they don't know how to handle them to keep them alive during the analysis um, part of the project. OK, so you have this instability problem. And in the purine pathway, the instability problem is a, is a real problem for mint, not just this guy. This guy is obvious, but for other guys. OK, so then the, the next question is, where else, and if you're thinking about metabolism in general, where else might you want to have organization of your enzymes? You might want to have it if you generate an intermediate in the pathway, and then there, it's a branch point for four other metabolic pathways. Okay, so there's an intermediate in this pathway. 
that can go to thiamine biosynthesis, to histidine, um, to tryptophan biosynthesis. So I'm not going to go through that, but that would be another place that I think is obvious that you could sequester under a different set of conditions and prevent the other pathways from happening. So if you have an intermediate that's a branch point, you can prevent, prevent other pathways. OK, so those two things I think are important. Um, one of the questions is, do you, do you increase the flux through the pathway? OK, so there's been a lot of engineering people. People really care about this in terms of engineering. If you want to engineer a metabolic pathway, um, should you be linking all your proteins together? OK, and, and there have been a lot of papers published, if you look at bioengineering papers, where they link all the pathways, all of the enzymes together in a way because they want them to cluster, because they think they're increasing the flux through the pathway. And so there are some people that do calculations that show you increase the flux. Other people do calculations say you don't increase the flux. So I think, again, this is an area that I think is very active and it's pertinent because everybody in Australia is trying to make biofuels. You need to do a lot of engineering from, from a lot of enzymes from different places, putting them together. How do you make them efficient? Okay, so we asked the question about flux. Um, and I think mathematically, um, people are looking at that. You need to know a lot about the kinetics of your system. These systems, there's a lot known um, about the kinetics. So, um, and then this goes to the question of how, you know, what is unstable and you need to think about diffusion. I think this is not so easy um, to think about this, but we do, do need to think about flux through the pathway. And then the other thing that's interesting in terms of regulation is it turns out in eukaryotes, where things are much more regulated than in prokaryotes, um, because of the increased complexity of everything, almost all of these pathways are organized um, on you know, one, multiple activities on one polypeptide. That's telling us something, I think, since we see this over and over and over again. Um, so there must be some reason to do that. So for all of these reasons, in terms of the purine pathway, this has been sort of a target for people for a long time. That's one of the reasons I decided to talk about it, because this was one of the first papers where people were excited that they thought they had evidence um, for this kind of organization um, in the cell. Not, not in the animal, but in the cell. OK. Let's see what, it, what I want to say next. I'm trying to keep this on some kind of a schedule. OK. so. Um, the so this is the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that these things are organized in some way. Um, and this was taken out of, probably it was a review paper. It wasn't taken out of the paper you had to read. Um, here's the cell. That's the nucleus of the cell. And what do you see? I think you can see this, right? You see these little dots, which they call punctate staining. Um, so what else do you need to know that they don't have in this picture that's really sort of key to thinking about this model. So here they just have a bunch of enzymes stuck together in a, in a little, little ball, OK? Um, so if you read the paper, there was a couple, yeah, how things. How you're getting the fluorescence. How you're getting the, the Yeah, so the, how you're getting the fluorescence becomes key. OK, so we're going to talk about that. How did, what was the major way they got, got the data? We'll talk about this in a minute in more detail. but. Whenever you're going to use fluorescence, you have to figure out how to get a probe onto your protein. So that's like a major focus. And this, again, is where chemical biology needs to play a role. We still uh, need better ways to be able to do this. You've seen over the course of the semester, I think, a lot of ways you could potentially do this. OK, we'll come back to that in a minute. But if you look at this, what's missing? And this is something that drove me crazy. I reviewed the original paper. OK, so they might have done that. Did you look at the supplementary material? They might have stained the membrane. OK, so I think everybody would believe you see little blobs. Yeah. OK, so what do you need to think about in terms of the little blob? The size, the size right. Um, yeah, so that's one thing. They don't, ever, they don't ever talk about this. You know, they might in some of the very later papers. But you know, 
if we know this, we have structures of all the enzymes in the pathway. So you could make a guesstimate about how big these blobs should be if you had one of each of these. Um, and this thing, these things are huge. So this would tell you that you would have many, many of these. This is one thing that I think they need to do some more thinking about, um, that they could have many, many of these things. And then the question is, why would you want many, many of these things? And how were they organized? Are they just sort of randomly organized, or are they really organized in, in something like that with this big, huge protein in the middle? That's, that's one of the ones they look at, FGAM synthase, that has a, a molecular weight of 150,000, which is huge for an enzyme. And so for a long time, and the catalytic activity, my lab has studied that, is way over here. And so you have a lot. Could it be a scaffold? OK, so that's where that, that idea um, actually came from. So, but the hypothesis is that these guys are organized and that under certain growth conditions, that's the key, and we'll look at those pictures, that you, you, they come together if they do this when you need to make purines and then they can go apart. Okay. All right. So the key thing, I think, is, and, and I wanted to, to just remind you why we're spending this time looking at fluorescence, and we probably should have spent two or three whoops, recitations on fluorescence methods, but we didn't, um, is that we've seen this many times before. We've seen stop flow fluorescence in the Rodnina paper where we were looking at the kinetics of fidelity of EFTU. And somehow they put a fluorescent probe onto the piece of tRNA. That was not trivial, how you got the probe there. And that probe could, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but could, it, could cha it changes um, when it's in different environments. And so you can use it as a way to, to monitor changes. Um, so reactive oxygen species, we just looked at this, and I decided to put this up since we didn't have the structures up last time. Um, fluorescine is one of the dyes that, pe this is fluorescine that people use. This is a version of fluorescine. But we um, talked about um, how do you know your, that epidermal growth factor is, is generating um, hydrogen peroxide, okay? So what we need is a sensor of hydrogen peroxide. So we talked about that last time. Um, and this is the sensor that people use. And why do they use it? We talked about it, but we didn't have the structure. So they use the diacetate of this molecule. Um, this one, they use the triacetate. The one that they use in the paper it was the diacetate. Um, anyhow, you need to get the fluorescent probe into the cell. So that's something you're going to have to deal with. And so if you acetylate it, you don't have phenols or phenolates, which might not get through the membrane, which apparently they don't. So then when they get in the cell, what do they do? They hydrolyze. Okay. And so what happens is when they hydrolyze, uh, they are now, you have these hydroxylated compounds that are able um, to be oxidized by an oxidant. And one of the oxidants that can do this and there are others that can do it as well, um, is hydrogen peroxide. So people use this as an as a, a indicator of hydrogen peroxide, but it's not specific. Yeah? So they, are they also trapped after the S ring, like from diffusing back out to the? No. I mean, I don't think they diffuse back out because I think they're the phenolates. So I think the diffusion out, like with many of these things, like if you use, lots of times you esterify phosphates to get them into the cells. Once they hydrolyze, they charge, they don't get back out. Okay, so I, I don't really know, but that's what I would guess. So I guess the, the key thing and, and the basis for some comments that I made in class was that we don't really have, we don't know that this is specific for one reactive oxygen species. And so um, there are lots of people in the chemistry biology interface trying to make specific sensors. Okay, that's not easy to do. The hydrogen peroxide, they're getting better. And in fact, Ting's apex, which is a peroxidase, sort of similar to what we talked about with uh, peroxyredoxins and the myloperoxidase, um, can actually function as a hydrogen peroxide sensor. Um, so anyhow, what happens is that when it gets oxidized, it becomes fluorescent. So it's non-fluorescent, becomes fluorescent. So it just gets turned on and you can see something, okay? Um, so that's something we talked about. Um, you talked, to, we, in Liz's part of the course, we talked about the fact that we can, 
watch protein unfolding um, in the prote in the uh, the E. coli proteasome. Okay, and what did you look at in the proteasome? Clip X, clip P. You looked at Titan that had a little tryptophan on it. Okay, and tryptophan can absorb. It's not a very good thing because it absorbs in the in the UV. Um, but tryptophan fluorescence is used. Lots, there are lots of tryptophan, so it's also really hard to use. But Titan is this, was this little tiny protein, and it was the only tryptophan. And they also did experiments with green fluorescent protein, which is what we're using in this paper. We remember they pull on it, and you pull, and you pull, and you pull, and then all of a sudden it unfolds, and you lose your chromophore. So you go from the on state to the off state. Um, so. All of these things, binding measurements, we, you talked about, you had one problem set. I don't know whether you guys did that problem set or not, but there was a, um, what was the calcium sensor? Does anybody remember? Anyhow, there was a calcium sensor where you were asked in the problem set for, for a something or other that you were asked to measure the KD for. And you can do binding assays. So fluorescence is an incredibly powerful tool, is, is the take home message. And we've seen it throughout the course, we just haven't talked about it. So now the key thing, and we're going to talk a little bit about sort of fluorescence at a, probably a freshman level. You, m many of you guys, who, who are the undergraduates? You guys. Have you done fluorescence experiments? You haven't done in, 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 the, in the lab? I thought we had two Eureka labs that were fluorescence oriented. No? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we did, uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> so Tim doesn't Tim's, you know, sen doesn't he he does sensors to sniff? I don't know what to sniff, but to sniff something TNT or. Right, but we didn't use fluorescence. You didn't use fluorescence for that, okay? Or the Tokmakov lab. The the one experiment we did in lab is we um, labeled a protein with a uh, green absorbing dye. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you guys are experts then on fluorescence. Well, hopefully you <laughs> anyhow. So so one of the questions is we need to have ultimately ultimately the key thing for any of this is we're gonna have to have a fluorophore. So that's the so we need the, the key starting point is a fluor a four. And what are fluorophores? So you, you want something that's usually aromatic and large, it could be it could have a lot of nitrogens in it. Um, oh, I, I knew I forgot something. So there's a book called Molecular Probes. Okay, so I gave you a handout um, on fluorescence. I forgot to bring the book. If anybody wants to see it, this book is worth its weight in gold if you're a chemical biologist, because this has everything in the world you need to know about fluorescence. It's described in a thoughtful way. They sell all the probes, um, and if you want to do something to tweak something, they'll help you do all of that. So this book, this, this Molecular Probes book, I think it's online now. I have a copy that's five years old. I use it a lot. Um, it's a really important book. And I got this out of the book. And it just shows you in the book, they have all these pictures of these fluorophores. So they're just big, huge, greasy molecules. Um, you have to worry about solubility a lot of the time. So you have to stick sulfates or something um, that ends up um, making it soluble. So. Um, that's going to be a key thing. So we need to have a floor for, and we have many options, and we can buy these things. Okay. Okay. So what's this? Okay. So what we want to think about is this. So um, in your the latest version of your handouts, I've written down what I'm going to say, but it's pretty simple. Um, from th for for um, it's pretty. I'm t I'm talking about this in a pretty simplified um, viewpoint. But what we're going to see is these fluorophores are going to allow us to, um, they allow us to do assays. I'll show you a quick example of that. Um, that is you can have something that is, you can have a molecule that is quenched. So you have a quencher on one side, I'll show you, and I'll show you how the, where the quenching comes from. As something fluorescent on the other side, you can't see anything. You cut it in half. It could be a protease, it could be a nuclease. The quencher goes away, and you see fluorescence. Um, you can have a sensor for metal binding, which, which Liz talked about. So you have 
two fluorophores, okay? You gotta figure out what the right fluorophores are. Something binds, they change conformation, and they change conformation in some way that you can actually detect a shift in the wavelength. So, and then you, you're looking, in our case, we're just sticking something on the end to see something, you were making a protein fluorescent, that's all we're doing. Um, so there are, you can use it for assays, you can use it for fret, and in the current, so you can measure distances, we're not gonna go into that. Um, but any of you that are interested in the current version of the handout, I have sort of a, a short tutorial on what FRED is and where you should go to look this up. Um, and then we just basically have a fluorescent tag. Okay, and we'll, talk, we'll come back and talk about the tag. We already talked about the fact that we have green fluorescent protein, red fluorescent protein tags, but we'll come back and talk about the other tags. So we have a fluorophore, and so what does that mean in terms of the in terms of what's going on. So you have your molecule, and your molecule has a ground state. OK, so which we'll call this S0. This is the ground state. And you have many vibrational modes. And you have this big, huge fluorophore that can ab absorb. Your electron in your fluorophore can absorb a photon. OK? And so what happens is so we're going to have um, excitation with a photon at a certain way, at, at a wavelength that can be absorbed by the electron in your molecule to the excited state, which they call S1. Um, and so you can have your electron going to an excited state. Okay, and we have a wavelength of light where that happens, and that depends on the structure of your molecule. So you don't want to be in the UV region. You want to be out in the region where you have less interference. And so that's the key game you have to play. To get into that region in the visible, you really have to put a lot of stuff on here. You just can't make a small little molecule that absorbs at 600 nanometers. So that's part of the problem. So you're making big things of necessity so you can actually see something happen. Okay, and so then what happens under those conditions? So we're gonna have um, the excitation wavelength of light um, at a certain lambda max. You absorb, it's just like absorption. You, you have a certain wavelength that it absorbs more frequently. Then what happens in the excited state? On, on a very fast time scale, um, you lose energy. Okay, so under this, these conditions, you're doing a relaxation. And then we'll see in a minute, I'll talk about what are the mechanisms of relaxation, but that can tell you, you can use that rela those relaxation mechanisms in a different way to design your fluorescent um, experiments. So what you see in this cartoon is that you're relaxing on a very fast time scale and um, physical chemistry has told us that to see fluorescence, it needs to go down. So these are the vibrational modes. So you're exciting um, your electron, electronically and vibrationally, okay? Um, and then you need to go down in vibrations. You're losing energy somehow. What happens to that energy? Okay, we can talk about what can happen to that energy. And when it gets to the lowest level of the excited state, you then fluoresce. Okay, and so, and that also happens on a, on a pretty fast time scale. So, the key thing here, so when you get to the lowest, so this is the lowest level, it fluoresces. And so, this is where the, the photon emits. Okay, so the photon wavelength for emission or H nu emission. Okay. And the key thing that you probably have heard about again when you were introduced to fluorescence is because you're losing energy here, what happens to the energy? You're going to longer wavelengths. Okay, so the excitation and the emission wavelengths are distinct, and that's called the Stokes shift. So it's the wavelength of excitation versus the wavelength of emission. So you have a Stokes shift. which is the wavelength of excitation minus the wavelength of emission. Okay. 
And so you need to look at molecules. People have spent a lot of time. You saw those 25 lists of things where people have designed things that actually work um, quite effectively. Okay. And so then the question is, you're losing energy. You, always, you are always going to be at longer wavelengths. Okay, so that's good. That makes it easier to see because there aren't that many things inside the cell um, that have a, give you a background, which is what you need to worry about in all of the experiments you're doing inside the cell. Um, the brightness, we'll come back to that um, in a minute. So what, what kinds of models can give you, what, what kinds of mechanisms are there for relaxation of the excited state? Okay, and so there are a number of mechanisms um, that can be involved. And um, one is, again, um, non-radiative relaxation. And how does that happen? So you're changing vibrational modes. And when you're in the excited state, if you're in solution, you have interactions with solvent or other molecules, all of which can affect this kind of transition. If you're in the active site, there can be other things. That, so the key here is the environment. And again, it could be solvent. It could be protein. Um, and the only way you can tell is by actually looking at the fluorophore on your molecule to end up um, seeing um, what you end up seeing. Um, OK. so. A second way that you can see, and you probably saw this in your introductory, yeah? So what would be like an example? Like if a unit of the energy being released is a photon in one case, for okay. non-radiative, what's the unit of energy? What is the unit of energy? So energy, heat is one way that you lose all of this, yeah. So it's vibrational energy. I would say it's mostly heat, okay. yeah. So you're changing. Um, excitation levels somehow. And the, the beauty of fluorescence, and this is the key to the sensitivity, is you're not doing anything to your molecule. OK, so your electrons got excited. They give off a little heat or whatever. They somehow change a little bit, and then they go back down to the ground state again. So what can you do? You can excite them again. So this can happen over and over and over again, unless the molecule and the excited state becomes destroyed. So that's called photobleaching. OK, so the key thing here, and this is, I think, um, this ability to recycle is the key to sensitivity. But again, I haven't used fluorescence inside the cell. I've never done this self, myself experimentally, so I don't really know. But you hear about photobleaching all the time. So I think this is not a trivial thing that you can just blow off. You know, it would be nice. But what you're doing is you're using the same excitation and then loss and excitation and loss over and over and over again. And so um, it provides a much more sensitive assay than what you normally see for something like absorption. Um, OK, so um, let's see. There was one other thing. Oh, so we talked about. Um, this mechanism, non-radiative relaxation, um, how else could you relax? You can go from a singlet state to a triplet state. OK? I'm not going to talk about intersystem crossing. Yeah. So you can go from the singlet excited state to the triplet state. I'm not going to talk about this, but the triplet state then can phosphoresce. OK, we're not, we're not going to be discussing that at all, but that's one possibility. Um, we just talked about the fact um, that you can have something in there that quenches the fluorescence. It interacts with something in a distance-dependent fashion. And that, again, affects the intensity of your fluorescence. So you also have um, reaction with the second molecule. Okay, and that can become important. It could be good or bad. If it reacts with oxygen, 
what happens is oxygen, the energy is immediately transferred to the oxygen. That's why in many fluorescence experiments you remove oxygen from all of your samples. It acts as a quencher. So you have, an, you know, it could be oxygen which acts as a quencher. Or it could be another fluorophore, okay? In which case then if everything is, is set up correctly, you can get the energy to shift, the energy of emission can get shifted to longer wavelengths. So that's what FRET is all about, okay? So it could not, the second molecule could be another fluorophore, okay? So those are sort of ways that you can relax. Um, and then you can set up different kinds of experiments depending upon what the objective is uh, of using, using fluorescence. So I've written this out in more detail. Um, and for those of you who want to look at FRET, I've defined FRET, I've given you the equations. Um, and people use this quite a bit inside the cell. You need to study this. Um, there are a lot of issues associated with it that you need to think about. Um, and I'll come back. You need to think about, um, it's not, so there are a lot of constants um, that determine the rate constant for your FRET, okay? And so you just, and, and you need to think about all these constants to be able to interpret the data in a thoughtful way. Um, and I've given you a t tutorial that I thought was pretty good that I got off the web um, that just shows what FRET is. Um, and that we have many, many dyes that we can measure distances from 10 to 100 angstroms using FRET. Uh, that's not in this paper, so I didn't. And this just sort of is a cartoon of what I was just telling you. So here, you might have an interaction, but if you cut it, the interaction could be gone, okay? Here, you might have no interaction, but when some small molecule binds, you see an interaction, and you can pick this up using fluorescence changes, okay? So, every, and people do these kinds of ex experiments all the time, and um, this kind of an assay is extremely, there are two kinds of assays that one does, so if you work in a pharmaceutical company, People do this all the time. They want a very sensitive assay. Everybody uses fluorescence. They might use an assay like this, where you go from nothing to something, okay? So you have high sensitivity. Um, and the other thing they use is, which I gave you in your handout, is fluorescence polarization, which I'm not gonna be talking about. But those are the two major methods that people develop assays around in the pharmaceutical industry. So fluorescence is here to stay. We still need better tools. Um, it can be quantitative. Um, you can measure a quantum efficiency of the electron light that's involved in the excitation and the photon that's involved in the emission. If it's 100% efficient, then your quantum efficiency is one, anyhow. So you have a whole range of quantum efficiencies. Um, okay, so, so now what I want to do is relate, but we'll at least get to the other um, okay, so this is telling you what I just told you. Okay, so I, I want to just introduce to you some of the, the issues that we're going to be facing. And we are going to talk about this in class, probably Monday or on Wednesday morning. Okay, so I'll extend this in class. But they've, they've attached green fluorescent protein to all of these things. So this is issue number one. What, what should they have done in these papers that they didn't do? if you read the paper carefully. I mean, it's hard to read a science paper because <laughs> all the key pieces of data are, are in supplementary information. So they made a few, in all of these, I can't remember what they made, but they made fusion proteins, right? So here you have a purine enzyme and here we have some kind of a fluorescent protein. So that's the probe they're using. Okay, so what's wrong with that, with the way they did their experiments? Can anybody? Did anybody look at the more details of what's going on? So what would, if you made this fusion, what would be the first thing you would do with a fusion protein? Right, exactly. GFP, I'm going to show you in a second. Well, I think I can show you this in a second. These are just the ways they were looking. But you have all these probes. GFP is over here. These are the organic dyes. Um, here's an antibody. We'll come back to that. So GFP is big. Okay, so does it change activity? They didn't assay that. To me, that's mind-boggling, okay, because I've dealt with these. I know these proteins, that one protein, the so two of them they're dealing with, one's a trifunctional protein, the other one's 150 kilodaltons. These proteins are not 
easy to deal with. Okay, so to me, this is a key thing. So this goes back to the Mark Cut paper where he's saying, well, I mean, maybe these things don't express very well and they aggregate, they don't fold. We saw how complicated the folding process is. What, what is the second thing? How do they get the proteins into the cell? How do they get, they don't get proteins into the cell. How do they get, how do they, yeah, how do they get GFP constructs into the cell? Yeah, transient transfection. What 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 is the issue there? Without going into details, but what's the issue? Well, like wouldn't the cell's normal mechanism, like the, the cell's own enzymes, make So you do have a normal, the, you do have the normal enzyme. They didn't make any effort to knock out the purine enzymes. Okay, but I think the key thing with transient transfection is the levels. First of all, a lot of cells don't have anything, but then you don't care about that because you don't look at them because they're not fluorescent, okay? But do you think the levels are important? I think the levels are incredibly important. So the question is, they are 100-fold, 1,000-fold over the endogenous levels. And so to me, if the first experiments I would have done before I did any of these other experiments is I would have looked at, you know, you might have chosen the trifunctional protein, which they did because it has activities two, three, and five. And this other big, huge protein, which, so these are the proteins they focus on, is activity four. So four is huge. You might think it could function as a scaffolding protein to interact with activities two, three, five. All of that's totally reasonable, okay? Um, but they didn't deal, deal with those issues. So you need to figure out how to attach something that's fluorescent. So one way is genetically, okay, we, and we've seen this, so we're just fusing GFP onto the protein of interest. Um, another way in this paper also, and you mentioned that, that they were using endogenous antibodies, okay? So antibodies can't get into cells. Okay, so how do you assay this? So these are also tough experiments. So somehow you, you fix the cells, um, so they aren't falling apart when you're trying to perturb the cells to allow the antibodies to get in, okay? Um, and then you permeabilize the cells. Have any of you ever done that? I've, I've done it in yeast, and yeast is brutal. I mean, it works, but it's, it, the conditions are like it's a witch's brew, anyhow. Um, so then you, put, you, then you get the antibody in, and that's what, that's what you're looking at. And if you look in the, I have, we're not gonna get that far, but I have pictures of, you know, so when they compared the transient transfection with the endogenous levels, that might give them some feeling for what levels, the levels of expression um, actually are. And of course, the way that people um, really want to attach things is using small things, whatever these lists of dyes are that we have. And what are the methods that you guys have learned about to attach these fluorophores? So instead of using a genetic fusion, which is probably, that's a really good way, except that the protein, is, green fluorescent protein is big. Green fluorescent protein is also a dimer. So people have spent a lot of time engineering green fluorescent protein to be a monomer. So the ones you buy commercially now are all monomers. That, that would add complexity to everything on top of this. How would you attach some of these things? So we know what the structures of these things are. Um, so you could do a halo tag. Have you talked? We haven't talked about that. So give me another method. Give me a method we've talked about. Yeah. So, but how how would you do that? So how do you attach these handles? You want to attach a fluorophore. Okay. So it turns out that all of these things here, which you can't see, but you know these these little aromatic things have been synthesized. So click it on, they could have an acetylene there, but then it needs to be clicked to something. So, so you can't just, I mean, so how do you click it just? Yeah, so, but is that easy to do inside the cell? No, and in mammalian cells it's impossible. Okay, so you can't use unnatural amino acids um, inside the cell. The technology is not there at this stage. So. Um, so the question of how you attach this, you could make your, if you could make your protein outside the cell, 
you might be able to do that. But then you have the problem of getting your protein inside the cell. So getting a probe that's fluorescently uh, you're to labeling the protein of interest is not easy. Um, and Alice Ting's lab, again, has, has spent a lot of time, I, not that successfully, but using ligases that you can then incorporate into the cell that can then react with things you put onto your protein to attach fluorophores. But this is an area that's really important because in my opinion, looking at regulation inside the cell, we don't really want to perturb. We don't want to be at very high levels. And we want to be able to see something to understand regulation. So I think, um, so anyhow, the issue is that we want to be as small as possible. We don't want to be Brad's lab. What is Brad's lab? Does he use these nano bodies that are antibodies yet? No, it's, I, you know, they have all these. They have things called nanobodies now. So, and I think they like the little guys you make on your solid phase peptide synthesizer, but they um, are specific, they specifically bind to proteins. So there are only five examples that I've seen in the literature. So they act like antibodies, but they are. Like notins? Huh? Like notins? Like little, like. They're little tiny yeah. proteins that are maybe, I don't know, 50 amino acids that somehow, some guy at the University of Chicago, not Kent, uh, developed these things. And they, specific, they act like an antibody. They can specifically interact with the protein of interest. Um, and then you attach a green fluorescent protein onto it. So again, what you have is something smaller. Um, and so because with these antibodies, what you see is they're nonspecific, right? I mean, we've seen that. And with fluorescence, that means you have fluorescence background um, in everything you do. So anyhow, I think we're not that, so that's just, you're using fluorescence microscopy. This tells you why you're interested in fluorescence microscopy. And we'll just close here, and we're going to come back and talk about this um, in class. But this is sort of the example of the data that you need to think about. So over here is, in the presence of purines, you don't see any of these little dots. You remove the purines, OK? so. This is not so easy either, because the way we grow cells, we don't have defined media, right? I mean, we're using, I don't know what you guys use now, but fetal calf serum or something. Um, and it's got all this stuff in it that we don't really know what it is. We don't use defined media. Um, and apparently, when they, the Marcotte paper, when they were describing this, said it was not so easy to remove the purines. And the method they used to remove the purines also removed other stuff, OK? So you're stressing the cell. That was the take home <laughs> message. So under those conditions, you see something different. Okay? And so then they did another experiment because they were worried about levels. Um, here, they have an antibody to the trifunctional protein. And so this is what they see under low purine conditions. Does this look like this? I don't know. So you, so you can't tell by looking at one picture. OK, so you've got to do statistical analysis of all these things. So I think this sort of, we'll come back and talk about this um, in class. But I think this is the first example where people are trying to look at this. The data is interesting, but we've already raised issues of what some of the problems are. And I, hopefully, you can think about more of the problems. Yeah. <laughs>